feel right now, right here, God is releasing his day gift, his day gift of identity, of understanding who we are as his children, of who he calls us loved, saying you're my own, you're my son. And I think there's someone here that that may have been struggling with that identity of knowing who they are and who Christ has called them to be because maybe they've had a misrepresentation of who a father is through their earthly fathers. But I'm here to tell you that there's a heavenly father that loves you like no other. That loves you like no other. And this song is a personal song for me because I've been there. I have a biological father who I'm not that close to. And I remember being angry for the longest time. Like, why does my dad not love me? Why can't he just accept me for, for who I am? I'm, I'm his own, I'm his firstborn. But the moment I stopped thinking about myself and I gave it to God, God is like, Marcus, I've, I've loved you before he was even in the picture. So I think we need to release that and just begin to accept what God has called us already because our God incinerates the orphan spirit. He incinerates the orphan spirit. We are all his. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Just sing that over and over. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are to us. It's love so undeniable. I can hardly speak in peace. So unexplainable. I Hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, as you call As you call me Deeper still Lord, we thank you so much because you're a great father. 
You're a father to the fatherless, Lord. And you've adopted us as your own. You're a great shepherd, Lord, and you leave the 99 to find the one. Just thank you so much for the day gift of identity that we get to claim that we are yours. Because, Lord, if you conquered, we conquer as well. Despite whatever the world may say about us, Lord, we know that we are loved by you. Thank you so much for meeting us here and being a God of encounter. We thank you so much, Jesus. Amen. I've known Marcus since he was a little boy. And now he's a grown man. It's who he is. Child of God. Amen. God bless you. He'll be coming back, guys, so don't leave. <laughs> wow, what an experience, huh? You feel the Holy Spirit just moving through these guys, these young men, coming out in sound to praise the Lord. It's just a wonderful thing. You know, I've been talking on the first chapter of Revelation, and it's God's love story to humankind, and especially in the days in which we live. It's a writing for us to be blessed. In fact, the Bible says, blessed is a person who reads, who hears, and who does what's written in this book. How many of you want to be blessed? Amen? Amen. Do you know what the definition of blessed really means? It means simply to be happy. And if you're blessed, you are happy. Amen? Like a child who sings, I'm happy today, I'm happy today because the Lord is with me. Jesus is in my heart. We talked about the condition of the church, the seven churches that Jesus is writing to through John the prophet, the apostle. John wrote down the things that he saw and that he experienced. It was written for the time of the existing seven churches in Asia, and it's also written for the time period of the seven churches that exist throughout history. But it also is applied to us as an existing church today and as individuals as well. Last week, we discovered that Christ was mentioning to the church of Ephesus that they had lost their first love. And at first, I was thinking about my first love. What was that? Of course, now I recall when I first came to know Christ and I experienced his mercy, his grace, and forgiveness for forgiving me a sinner, a man that, a young man who had lived a life without Christ in his heart had done things to hurt other folks or to injure other individuals or take away from people. And he was able to change my life and to cleanse me from my sins, amen? And that's simply called grace. Grace is something that we don't deserve, neither do we earn. It's something that is given to us because of his love and because of who he is. Not because of what we do, you see, we don't score brownie points on earth to get to heaven. It doesn't matter how many times you come to church or how big of a check you write to the church or how many prayers you pray. It's all based on what Christ has done already. And Christ sends his love to us through his word. You see, he says it's expedient that I go, he was telling his disciples, because he was saying that pretty soon he was going to die and resurrect and go away, and they were upset. And he says, no, no, guys, it's better that I go because I'm sending you a comforter. A comforter, yes. He will convict the world of sin. You know what conviction is simply? It's just to be made known. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to be made fun of, you know. Um, it's not like a, a brother who hears you say a bad word and says, ooh, I'm going to tell mom. No, it's, it's simply the Holy Spirit that speaks softly to your ear and says, Richard, you know it wasn't right. But Jesus has a different plan for you. You see, he did not seek to condemn us. Condemnation is something that totally destroys. Condemnation is something that says you are unfit. No, we are not misfits. We are his children, amen? We are made in his image and in his likeness. We have been made to honor and to worship the most high God, the maker of heaven and earth. And today he wants to seal that through his word in the book of Revelation. And so he gives us an understanding of how to prepare for his coming because he, soon, he says here, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And that reward is to simply continue to be in his fold for eternal life. 
And so, with that, let us pray. Father in heaven, as we open up your word this morning, bless it. Speak to our hearts and to our minds and use me solely as a vehicle to convey your message, Lord. May your angels be present. May Satan be locked out. And Father, help us not just to hear and to read your word, but to do what it says. For we want to be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. So John wrote these things down. He says, unto the church of Ephesus, there are some things that I want you to understand. And now remember, he wrote to the seven churches. In fact, the number seven is very important in the scripture because it symbolizes God's perfection. So when he starts to write in Revelation to the seven churches, he's talking about God's perfect church. Now, is that an oxymoron? Does that actually exist? Is there a perfect church? Or like my friend from Brooklyn says, perfect? Is there anything that's perfect here? Can we be perfect? Yes, we can. Jesus demonstrated that as a man. He was perfect in every way. He was without sin. Why? Because he followed his father's teachings. Remember when Satan came to him and challenged him three times, Jesus didn't reply by, well, this is what my pastor said. No, he didn't use that line. And he didn't say, well, this is what I heard on the radio. No, he didn't use that line either. He just simply said, it is written. You see, Jesus was blessed. He was happy. He had studied the scripture. The scripture was written in his heart and in his mind. And he said, it is written thus and thus. We too need to be students of the scripture. And so the number seven is very important. And now in chapter two, verse one, it says that, there were seven stars that Christ held in his right hand as he walked in the midst of the seven candle golden stick, the golden candlesticks. Remember, remember we learned last week that those golden candlesticks represented the light of the world, God's heart, God's church. And now he holds seven stars in his right hand. What I like most about this verse is that Jesus was in the midst of of those seven churches or those seven lampstands that shine so brightly. Remember, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and if you believe in me, you two are light to shine brightly upon a hill so that all men shall be drawn up to me if we do what? If we lift up Jesus. What I like about this is that we know there are times that are going to be turbulent in the church history, in the past, we've seen that, and now in the future, we will await what is about to be. But have you had turbulent times in the church before? Have you sat in a church board? Thank you. Now you know what I'm talking about, right? There are so many churches that have so much disruption and turbulence, but Christ is always in the midst of his church. You see, no matter what happens to the church, the truth still moves forward. Amen? Amen. There still will be a remnant of people who trust and believe and obey his word and who share that gospel of hope with people. And that's what Inspire is all about. It's going about inspiring people in the public school, in the community center, at Publix or Winn-Dixie, wherever you shop, or maybe even the workplace. You see, Christ can be shared wherever you're at because you're a shining light and God is with us. Amen? You see, he says he's not going to leave us. He says, behold, I am with you until the very end of time. And his Holy Spirit is here to give us strength and to direct us and to empower and equip us so that we can meet the needs of others. And so he walks in the midst of the seven candlesticks. He says, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you can't bear the evil. You see, at that time... The church of Ephesus was one of the churches that was truly a light in the midst of all of the idolatry that existed there. But now the evilness started to seep into the church. And I mentioned that we have to be very careful about people coming into our churches with different types of dogmas or ideas because it causes division. It tears people apart. And as a shepherd of the church, I will do everything I can to protect that. You see, I have a slingshot, just like David. Anybody who walks through those doors and has a different message, 
I have no problem with that, folks, because God has given me the privilege of shepherding you. And I want to protect you. And so the people of Ephesus were enthusiastic at first about the message they had, but somewhere along the line, they became complacent. Somewhere along the line, they allowed the falsehoods of the idolatry around them to come in. You know, but let me tell you guys something. we got to be careful about that, too, because we can't stand at the door and, and look at everybody and say, well, hold on a minute, you can't come in here. No, the church is open to everybody. Amen? We just have to be careful about somebody coming in and starting a quote-unquote new teaching. And I've seen this many times before over my 36 years in, this, in the ministry. I've seen where a man says, I have a new idea. Guess what? You can only get to heaven if you take coffee enemas. <laughs> I haven't found that in the scripture yet. But he took several members of the church and they left their wives and families and businesses to follow a strange person like that. We have to be careful about people who come in with different messages, folks. You see, there's only one message. And it's contained in the two witnesses right here, the Old and the New Testament. It's contained in the Word of God. It's contained in these scriptures, folks. For all scripture is God-inspired or God-breathed or God-given and is profitable for doctrine. It doesn't say Richard has the answers. It says Jesus has the answers through his Word. And it is for our church to follow. Amen? And who is the church, by the way? Is it this beautiful building? No. It is you. It is you. It is you. Amen? Write it upon your hearts and in your minds so nobody can take it away from you. Jesus says, I know your works. I remember years ago, people would say, hey, you shouldn't go here and you shouldn't go there because the angels don't follow you. But somewhere I read in the scripture that God beholds all good and all evil. Now, when Jesus says, I know your works, he's not sitting on some cloud on some throne waiting for you to make a mistake and go, aha, I caught you. No, 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 no. He's walking with you wherever you go. Even if you go into those peculiar places, he is with you. Shortly after I got baptized, and I think I, I told you this, I'm not sure. I got old timers, so I may forget. So if you heard it, forgive me. Shortly after I gave my life to Jesus and I said I would walk with him, I went to a dance on a Friday night on the Sabbath. Because I really loved, you know, I, I taught Michael Jackson how to do his twirl and stuff, you know. But I went into a dance and first thing somebody did was put a beer in my hand and a cigarette in the other hand. And so we got on the dance floor and I'm starting to do my, magic, uh, my Michael Jackson twirl and as I came around, I saw a brother from church who got baptized the same I did, and he had, what, a beer in his hand and a cigarette in the other hand. And we saw each other, and the cigarette went to the floor and the beer behind the back. The Holy Spirit gave me a spiritual spanking that night. And he started to speak to my heart, Richard, I love you. It doesn't matter where you're at. I'm here with you. I claim you to be mine. Love me enough to follow me. Love me enough to trust me. Love me enough to hear my voice. And you know, we started to reason about why we were here and what we thought and believed. But you know, it was hard. It was hard for me to enjoy the rest of the night because the Holy Spirit was talking to me the whole night until I finally arrived home and I, I dealt with it and I said, Lord, help me to trust you more. Help me to obey your word. Help me to love you enough so that I could Follow what you have for me. You know, because when we follow God's word, when we trust enough in him, we will truly be blessed. Amen? We can seek all the things that the world has to offer. And, you know, we might enjoy it for a moment, but it's only for a period of time. Christ, his love lasts forever. In verse 4, God says, well, there's something that I have to talk to you about. One of the things that I like about you is that you've gone through many troubles and, and you've gone through it for me and you've never given up. However, you've lost the love you had for me at first. Has your wife taught you that, guys? You don't bring me flowers anymore. What's the matter? You don't love me? We used to go out on dates. 
You know, there was a time when my wife and I decided that, you know, we were so busy bringing up children and so busy in the church and so busy going to work that we needed time for each other. So every week on a Wednesday, we had a date night. And we never said, okay, where we're going. We just got in the car and went. The kids were old enough to take care of themselves, and so we'd go out for dinner to do what? To reacquaint ourselves with each other again, to dialogue, to communicate, to talk. And after we had a, a wonderful dinner, we'd go and, and watch a movie and enjoy holding hands and eating popcorn and reaching for the popcorn at the same time, you know, and getting sticky fingers with the butter and stuff, you know, sharing the soda with each other. And, It helped to strengthen our relationship. It helped to rekindle that first love I had for her. In fact, when I saw her from afar, it reminded me when I first saw her when she was 12 years old. And I told my buddy Rudy, she's going to be my wife. It reminded me of the first feelings I had for her. And when I held her hand for the first time and my, my palms got all sweaty. Do you remember that for the first time when you held hands with your girlfriend? It was an amazing feeling when you got those tingles inside your stomach that we call butterflies that said, something's going on here and I don't understand, but I think I'm falling in love. This is what it's like when you come to Jesus, when you take him by the hand and walk with him because he's going to take us to the promised land. But you won't have sweaty hands. All you'll see is the nail marks in his hands as he expresses his love for you. It's amazing who Jesus is in our lives. He says, you lost your first love for me. He says, you need to put me back in the center of your lives again. And what does that mean, putting him back in the... You know, in a marriage, it takes a lot of work. It doesn't mean that We have everything right. No, I've been married 36 years, been together 40. And you know what? I still don't got it right. We're still on a journey going to where? Till death do us part. Sometimes my wife would like to, (laughs) like to, you know, really tell me all the things that I've done to hurt her. But, you know, she loves me too much. She just gives it to me in little portions. Why? Because she knows I can't take it all. I'd probably get so upset I'd walk away from it. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He reveals to our hearts and minds what we've done as we leave the first love so that he can bring us back to strengthen that. You know, guys, take your wives out tonight. Hold her hand. Bring her flowers. Tell her how beautiful she looks. Cherish that wonderful gift that the Lord has given you today. Tell her, thank you for loving me, this wretched old guy. You know, I used to be, you know, I used to be good looking. I used to be skinny. Now look at me, ugly and fat. And she still loves me. It's amazing how much God loves us. No greater love has been demonstrated than what Christ has done for us. Why? Because you are precious in his sight and you are loved with an everlasting love. Amen? Amen. But he goes on to say, for some of the folks, I will have to allow the light to go out in the church because you've lost the first love. That doesn't mean that God wants your light to go out. He just says that you don't love him enough to carry the light. Long, long time ago, I saw a little girl. She must have been around seven or eight years old, and she was carrying her little brother who was about two years old. And this kid was a big kid. And I went to her and I says, baby, do you want me to carry him? She says, no, 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 he's not heavy. He's my brother. It didn't mean that she wasn't overwhelmed with his weight. It just meant that I'm ready to carry him no matter what I need to do because I love him. And Christ will carry you as well. Because he loves you so much. It's like the song says, it's who he is and who I am. We are his children. We are his offspring. We are his children. Amen. He goes on to say that he walks amongst us. 
And he says this in verse 7. To the person who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, says unto the churches. You know, we need to listen to God's Spirit again. Don't you believe that? To strengthen us, to refresh us, to renew us, to give us a new vision. Sometimes we're in the church for so long as we get, we get tired of the routines. You know, I, I started a church many years ago, and one of the first things I got rid of was a bulletin. You know why? Because... Bulletins cost a lot of money to keep up, you know, and a lot of information going to the bulletin, but you know what? Nobody reads it at the end of the day. In fact, I, I spent more time picking up bulletins and uh, off of the floor than they may be informative to some, but you know, it's just part of the routine. People just expected that. One day I went to a church and um, people were coming in, and this older woman says, Where's the bulletin? I said, well, ma'am, we don't have bulletins. I need a bulletin. I says, well, ma'am, there's about 10 other churches you can go to that will give you a bulletin. She was so upset because there was no bulletin. I says, what do we need to know? Really, we all know that church starts at 1130, right? <laughs> and if we're here till 5 o'clock today, that's fine. The Holy Spirit moves that way, right? Well, hold on a minute, Rich. <laughs> In, in the Spanish world, we used to do these vigilias. How do you translate that in English? Vigils. They would start at 6 o'clock in the evening and go to 2 or 3 in the morning. And people are like, serious? I got to wash my hair, you know? It's like, no, you know, when you're in the spirit of Christ, it doesn't matter what time it is. One of the most wonderful times I ever had was when I went to London. And I did a, week of, uh, a weekend of prayer with some kids. You know, it was one of these things where nobody wanted to be there. In fact, they had asked three other pastors to go before me. I'm always like the pinch hitter. They always call me when nobody wants to show up. Oh, there's Richard. Call him. But the reason why the three other pastors didn't want to show up, because when they found out that all the kids were black, they decided not to go. And so they called me, and I went. I didn't know what to ex experience. I didn't know what to I expect, but it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And you know what? They had a program set for all, every hour just about for these kids. It was a prayer conference. And on Saturday night, they were supposed to have these wonderful games and sport activities. And we ended right on time at 6 o'clock to have dinner and go back into activities. But somebody says, Richard, we're going to have a little bit of a Vespers. Will you say a few words? And I says, well, sure. And so I spoke for about 15 minutes thinking the kids were anxious to go and start with their games and sports. And you know what? They says, hey, wait a minute. I have something I have to say. One young kid stood up. And he started saying how I didn't want to come here this weekend. In fact, they literally picked me up and threw me in the back of the car and brought me here. I don't even have clothes. I've been wearing the same clothes for two days. And he says, but I'm so thankful I came because Christ has entered in my heart. And you know what? He just started singing. He sounded just like Mark, his beautiful voice. When I get to heaven, Mark, I'm going to sound just like you. Maybe even a little bit better. And one after the other started getting up and testifying to the Lord and singing. It was 2 in the morning, and nobody wanted to leave. Why? Because... We were worshiping the master. The Holy Spirit was refreshing us. The Holy Spirit was preparing us. The Holy Spirit was with us. God's Spirit is with us today. It says to the person who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen? To the person that overcomes this life, to the person who overcomes the trials and tribulations in this life, to the person that overcomes the illness and disease in this life, to the person that overcomes the separation, the divorce, the pain in this life, the person who overcomes death. It says here, we'll have a seat, or excuse me, we'll be able to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen? And consequently, have a seat with the Father in heaven. You see, when Jesus says he goes to prepare a place for us, it's, just, it's not just a party he's going to prepare. It's not just a little tiny home. He's preparing a mansion for us. He's preparing a place for us to dwell for eternity. A place where we can call home. A place called paradise. And a place to eat freely from the 
tree of life. Amen? And later on in the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, it talks about what that tree of life looks like. It says that it expands from one of the side of the river to the other, the river that flows from the throne of God. And it gives a new fruit every month. How would you like to have that tree in your house? Man, I used to love going to my grandfather's house in San Fernando, California. It wasn't a big backyard, but it had an avocado tree. It had a peach tree. It had a pear tree. It had apricot trees. It had grapevines. It had a citrus tree of lemon and lime and oranges. And we used to sit in the apricot trees and just eat apricots all day. And then, of course, in the toilet all night. I remember one time... We would go freely to the trees, and my grandpa said, Mijo, don't go and eat the peaches, okay? And we should have just listened to him because he knew his trees, but we snuck around the garage and picked from the backside of the tree because there were these white, juicy peaches that when you took a bite into them in the summertime, all the juices would just run down your cheeks. And as we were eating them, He noticed that he didn't see us, so he came outside looking for us. Richie, where are you? (gasps) Grandpa, hide. We're eating the peaches he told us to stay away from. And as he got closer, are you guys eating the peaches? No, Grandpa, we threw them to the ground. And he knew exactly where we were at. He took us by the hand, and he, he grabbed the peach off the tree. He took out his knife, and he cut it open. He says, do you see why I don't want you eating peaches? In the center of this big, beautiful peach were nothing but worms, little white worms. And as a result, that night, we found evidence of that in the toilet. God tells us that there's worms in this world, folks, that we need to be careful from. Just obey what he says and trust in him. He knows what's best for us. Why? Because he loves us and cares about us. Boy, our stomachs were messed up the whole night. And if we just would have obeyed what he said, we would have been okay. Christ wants us to know that while we struggle in this life, he is in the midst of that struggle. Amen? Have you ever been in a situation where you say, where's dad? Where's mom? Where's big brother? Where's big sister? Where's the pastor in all of this? You see, Christ is with us during the good times and the bad times, in fact, all times. And he wants us to know that if we trust him, he will, we will become overcomers. Do you remember the story in the book of Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananias? I know you guys know them better by their Babylon names, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were told that at the sound of the music that everybody was to kneel and bow down to this 90-foot statue of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had constructed to look like him so that everybody would come from all over the parts of Asia and worship him as supreme prince of prince and god of gods of all of Babylon. And so when they started to play the music, everybody bowed down in worship of this golden statue, except for the three Hebrew boys who loved God with all their heart, their strength, and their might, who wanted to keep and obey his commands. To those three Hebrew boys who had experienced God in their life and had been safe, even though they were captives in Babylon, because God had allowed them to be found favor from the king, Nebuchadnezzar. But somebody says, oh, king, live forever. Guess what? Those three Hebrew boys that are part of your, your, your kingdom, they didn't bow down when the music played. What's the matter with them? Are they not patriots? Maybe they're spies. So the king goes over to them and says, hey, guys, somebody just told me you guys didn't bow down. What's the matter? Maybe you misunderstood. Just remember, we're going to give you another chance. When the sound of the music happens again, just bow down. And they says, oh, king, live forever, king. We're sorry to, you know, that was no mistake. What? No, 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 no. You see, we believe in the God, the maker of heaven and earth and everything in it. We believe in the commandments of God that says, 
Worship the Lord and him only, and only him thou shalt serve. Don't bow down to any graven image that's in the heavens above, the earth below, or the water beneath the earth. You see, we love our God. He's kept us healthy and safe throughout the years of our captivity. And we were going to serve him. And you know what? You can play the music all you want. Let it be known that we will not bow down to your stature. Are you guys defying me? I will have you thrown into the fiery furnace that melted this gold to make this statue. Well, listen, Mr. King, that's your prerogative, but let it be known that if you choose to do that, we know that our God is great enough to save us. But if he chooses not to, we will not bow down to your statue. These guys had a lot of as they say in where I'm from, a lot of cojones, right? It's like, well, these guys, who do these kids think they are? Don't they know who I am? Have you ever been told that? Don't you know who I am? Yeah, I know who you are, but do you know Jesus? Do you know the one who gave his life for you? Do you know the one who created us in his image? Do you know the one who breathed into the nostrils of a human being and made him a, a living being? Do you know that it is Jesus who loves and heals and strengthens and restores. It is Jesus who gave himself so that we can have eternal life in heaven. It is Jesus who says he's coming back for us because he doesn't want us to suffer anymore. Let it be known, King, that whatever you do, we're ready to remain faithful to Christ no matter what. And he got so angry and so mad that he commanded that that oven be heated seven times hotter than before. Wrapped those three young men in sackcloth and in rope and had them thrown into the fiery furnace. The men who threw them in were consumed by the heat immediately. And then somebody says, King, get over here. You got to check this out, man. The king goes over there and looks into the fiery furnace. And these guys are walking around amongst the flames of the fire. Was this a miracle? Was he seeing what he thought he saw? And then he says, hey, hey, wait a minute, guys. Didn't we put three young men into the fire? How come I see four? And now check this out. A pagan king recognizes who Jesus is. He says, for this other figure in the midst of the fiery furnace seems to be that of the Son of God or the Son of Man. How did he know that? And so he calls out to Meshach, Sadrach, and Abednego, or Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah. He says, guys, come out. Is that true? Are you, you're not even scared. They came out. They didn't even smell like smoke. Their bonds were loosed. They came out high-fiving each other. The fourth person whoosh, vanished and went back up from where he came. It's amazing that God chose to demonstrate to a pagan God, the strongest and most powerful God, uh, king, excuse me, that existed in all the world in the kingdom of Babylon. He chose to save these three kids from the fiery furnace. Why? Because they were obedient to God no matter what. By trusting him, obeying him, and loving him enough to obey and keep his commands. They honored him. And when you honor God, he will honor you. Amen. He will provide for you. Amen. He will walk with you amongst the fiery furnace through all the difficult times that you may have in your life. You know, about 10 years ago or more, I got a call from my father. and It was on his birthday. <clears throat> And he said, mijo, I got some bad news. And I says, what's that, dad? And he's, he says, uh, tengo, um, I have uh, prostate cancer. He couldn't say prostate that well. Tengo prostate cancer. And he says, but don't worry about it, mijo. Everything's going to be good. Going to go see the doctor. So as Mexican-Americans or Chicanos, we used to joke around because whenever you got sick, you know, your, your grandmother, your abuelita, your mother, they, they'd give you a little concoction that they had in the backyard of spearmint. Uh, tea and honey and lemon or the other remedy was a 7-Up <laughs> for whatever ails you so I said dad did you drink a 7-Up 
And he said, yeah. And I said, well, did you put a lemon in it? Because, you know, Latinos believe lemon cures everything, right? I said, Dad, did you put a lemon in it? And he said, yeah, mijo, I put a lemon in it también, pero sabes que? You know what? It didn't work. That's when I knew he was dying, when he told me that. That was his way of telling me he was dying. It was amazing, though, because my father, you know, we were Roman Catholics, and he went to church. And, in fact, in his last years, he was serving as a deacon in the church, picking up the offering. But my father really wasn't the man who would tell us, you need a prayer, you need to do this. But one thing he did do when I grew up as a kid is he would come in every night and say the Our Father with us. He taught me how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us, Catholic, our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Deliver us from this present day evil. And you know when I was there at the bedside and my mother asked me to pray. I couldn't remember that prayer. I started to pray it and I guess with my grief and my sorrow and my pain, it, the words just would not come out but tears. But I'm thankful my father taught me how to pray because you know what he said to me, he says, don't worry mijo, everything's going to be okay. Before he went into his sleep. It's amazing how even though he didn't live the way some people think he should have lived, he still had Jesus in his heart in his own way. And he was unafraid to encounter death. And I tell people, one time I, I had a situation where there was a girl who was lying in her deathbed, and the family said, Richard, can you talk to her? Because she needs to fall asleep already. She's suffering too much, but she's holding on for us. And I went to her and I whispered into her and I says, Mijita, meaning daughter, I says, are you afraid of dying? And she nodded with tears in her eyes. And I says, don't worry about dying. It's just merely a time of sleep. When you wake up again, you're going to see the face of Jesus. You're going to hear his voice. You're going to rise from the grave, and you're going to rise in an incorruptible body, a body that will never die again, a body that will never see disease again, a body that will never experience pain or hurt again, a body that will live forever. And she smiled with tears in her eyes. She took her last breath one hour after that. You see, folks, we're going to go through some difficult times before the coming of Jesus. But Jesus says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome this world. Amen? The book of Revelation goes into a lot of things of symbolism. But, you know, Jesus talks about, he says, those seven stars represented the seven churches, and I'm walking in the midst of them. Those seven candlesticks or lampstands represents the seven churches in the lights of the world, and I'm amongst them, and I am the light of the world. If I be with you, whom shall you fear? You see, God is with us today. Don't you agree? Turn off the news and turn off your phones and let the Spirit of the Holy God speak to our hearts and to our minds. You know, folks, today's a day to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is yet near. Today is a day of overcoming and seeking God's presence in your life to again make him the center of your life, to again call upon him to give you that first love so that you can go out and share the joy of being a Christian with somebody by how we demonstrate it in our lifestyle and how we treat others. You know, I want to call Mark and his buddies back up again. That we're gonna, he's gonna have one more special music for you guys. But this is what I'd like for you guys to do: is as he sings, let the Holy Spirit cover you with His love, and refresh your spirit and your commitment to God. That your first love will be rekindled. That your hope and trust in Him will 
be taken seriously. Because you know what, folks? I'm tired of doing church. I just want to go home. I'm tired of seeing the pain and suffering out there. I'm tired of being in the nursing home and in the hospitals. I'm tired of hearing the sirens of the police. And I'm tired of reading uh, news reports of children being killed in schools. I'm just tired. I want to go home. But I need to be refreshed of the Holy Spirit. And I need to continue to build Jesus as the center of my life. And I invite you to do the same. So I'm going to challenge you today that as you hear Marcus and the group play this one last song, think about your commitment to Christ. Think about where you've been in your life and where you're at now. And is the Spirit calling you to renew your life? Is the Spirit saying to you, daughter, son, trust in me, walk with me, Commit your life to me. And if that be your desire, I just want you to come forward. We're going to pray together. So listen to them. Let the Spirit move you. jealous for me He loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy and All of a sudden I am unaware of His afflictions He Lifts by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are, and how great your affections are for me. And so, how He loves us so! Oh, how He loves us! How he loves us a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy but all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize Affections are for me. Yeah, yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. His portion and He is our prize Drawn to redemption by the grace in His eyes If grace is an ocean we're all sinking So 
Heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss And my heart turns violently inside my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets When I think about the way that He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves Yes, He loves us right in order to come to Jesus he says come as you are come today come y'all that are laboring heavy laden and I will give you rest I will give you the blessing and equip you to be able to do the things that you need to do you see God calls us he calls in perfect people to do a holy work he calls folks that are hurting that are in pain to continue to share the hope of glory in this present world in this present time So if you just want to recommit your life to Christ, just stand where you're at. If you feel the Holy Spirit calling you to commit to more, then I want to pray for you. If there's something in your life that is inhibiting you from doing that, then just push it aside and say, Lord, I'm yours. Take me. Let me tell you something, folks. A Christian is not a Christian until they start to share their faith. When they share their faith with somebody who has yet to know Jesus, it's a wonderful experience. Today, God is calling you. No matter how young, no matter how old, no matter where you've been in life or what you're going through today, He wants to use you for His honor, His purpose, and glory. So don't, don't ever think that you're not good enough to do that or that you're not equipped to do that. If you know Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, then share it with somebody. Amen. I'm grateful for these two lives that have come up here. I want to have a special prayer for both, both of them today. So join me in prayer, won't you? Heavenly Father, you've called us because you love us. And through your grace and through your mercy, you've strengthened us and pardoned us of our sins. And now we rejoice. We rejoice, Father, because you said, Blessed is he who overcomes, and we want to be overcomers of this world. We want to be overcomers of sin. We want to be able to walk with you and teach others about your joys and about your promises of hope and glory. So, Father, today, we thank you, Lord, for being with us. We thank you for these two lives that have come before you. And the rest of the church, Lord, we thank you, Father, for all that you've given them. Father, be with us today, each and every one of us in our families. Help us, Lord, to continue to walk faithfully with you and to observe your commandments that will help us to live. Help us, Father, to trust in you in all things and to remain faithful until the very end. Bless us, Lord, and thank you for this time together. Now dismiss us in your presence. For this we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we do it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Lord be with you all. Happy Sabbath to all of you.